Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the 2015 George J. Mitchell Distinguished International Lecture. I'm Dan Shea, the director of the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement and Professor of Government here at Colby. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Senator Susan Collins, members of the Mitchell and Nail families, our many community friends, the Colby faculty, staff, and students. The George J. Mitchell Distinguished Lecture is designed to bring a prominent policy leader to Colby to foster interaction with students, faculty, members of the broader community while honoring Waterville native George Mitchell. My role tonight is to briefly introduce Senator Mitchell, who will then introduce our guest speaker. It's been said that the more famous the speaker, the shorter the introduction. If that were true, my remarks about Senator Mitchell would be very brief. Surely the residents of Waterville, Maine, the state, the rest of the nation, know of his work as a prosecutor and a federal judge. They would be aware of his distinguished career in the Senate, his efforts as a negotiator in Northern Ireland and the Middle East, and that he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor given by the U.S. government. Many would also know that he was chairman of the board of directors of Walt Disney Corporation, and many of us have read at least one of his four books. Mainers also know that last spring he was inducted, the senator was inducted into the Maine Sports Hall of Fame for his basketball prowess at Bowdoin, as well as his role in the investigations surrounding steroid use in Major League Baseball in 2002 and in the wake of the Penn State sex abuse scandal in 2012. And of course, hundreds of college students, thousands of college students across the state, including many in this room, know the difference that the Mitchell Institute scholarship has made in their lives. This incredible initiative, with the goal of making sure that no Maine kid with the qualifications and ambitions to pursue a college education would be denied that opportunity due to limited financial resources, has provided significant tuition assistance to over 2,300 Mainers, totaling over $1.5 million. I did say 11.5, didn't I? Oh, thank you, I didn't want to get that wrong. You know, Senator, in an interview, I, I saw an interview of the Senator on this program. And he suggested in that interview that it was his most important legacy, the most important thing he's ever done. And we all know the Senator's resume. What an incredible statement. It says so much about George Mitchell's values, his priorities, his heart, and it says so much about why he is so beloved in the state of Maine. Finally, I'd like to say just a few words about his approach to public service. Throughout his career, from his early days in the Senate to the creation of the Bipartisan Policy Center, George Mitchell has demonstrated that public servants can have strong convictions, they can be ideological, and they can be proud partisans. Their responsibility, their duty, however, is to understand those on the other side also have strong convictions and they deserve respect. His off-sided line, that although he is regularly asked to do so, God does not take side in American politics, seems especially fitting these days. Senator Mitchell's career exemplifies a cherished American ideal that compromise and humility reveals strength, not weakness. His career is built on the beliefs that analysis, negotiation, and respectful dialogue can solve even the most seemingly insurmountable problem. It is my pleasure to welcome back to Colby. Please join me in welcoming Senator George J. Mitchell. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dan, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to all of you here tonight for your presence, for your support for this program, 
and especially for you to join me in welcoming Senator Collins here this evening. Before I introduce her, I, I do want to mention a few other people. First and foremost, I think I should mention President Green and his wife just first year at Kobe already made a tremendous impact, not just at this institution, but at education around the state and in the city of Waterville. So as a native of Waterville uh, and someone who used to work at Kobe, uh, <laughs> I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, please join me in welcoming and paying tribute to President Green. Stand up. Stand up. My father was a janitor at Colby, and uh, so I spent a lot of time up here. And when I was at Bowdoin, in order to earn money to pay the tuition at that very expensive school, I worked here at Colby uh, during the summers. So uh, the, I see students here. Does anybody here live in Foss Hall in the dormitory? You live in Foss Hall. Yeah. Well, I built personally that beautiful terrace lawn out in front of Foss Hall. <laughs> and the first thing I told President Green when I met him for the first time last summer is I check on that lawn every summer <laughs> when I come through Waterville. So whatever other demands on your resources are, make sure you keep that lawn up. That's a very important part of my life. So I, we have a long history here at Kobe. My brother John has just finished 44 years of work here as an assistant coach. The basketball gymnasium is named after him. The amazing thing is that Kobe has survived 44 <laughs> years of the Swisher. He is, of course, the greatest member of our family, the greatest basketball player ever to come out of the state of Maine. If any of you have six or eight hours someday, you've got nothing to do, you ought to drop in and visit him. He'll tell you about it. <laughs> but I do want to recognize the Swisher and his wife, Pranella. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other members of my family who are here, I won't introduce them all because there are too many. It'll take the whole evening, and I know Susan's got to get going tonight. So, but I do want to mention my brother Paul and my sister Barbara. They couldn't make it into either Colby or Bowdoin, but they did very well at the University of Maine, both of them. Uh, <laughs> and have been, uh, have been successful. Well, for me, it's always wonderful to come back here to see my family, to be at what is, always has been, and always will be my home here in Waterville, uh, and tonight to have the special pleasure of introducing uh, our guest speaker, Senator Susan Collins. Susan uh, is a proud, a rustic county woman. How many people here have never been to Arusta County. Raise your hand. I'm well, you're, she's watching. Well, as you all know, it is a very special place. Uh, tremendously independent, pragmatic, wonderful people. And Susan's family has roots going back many generations in Arusta County. Her mother and father each served as the mayor of Caribou. Her father and her uncle each served in the Maine State Senate. Her uncle served on the Supreme Court of Maine. So although many of you have not been aware of it, the Collinses have been running the state for a really long time. <laughs> and I have to say, doing a great job at it. Susan has had a truly distinguished career. She worked in, she worked at Husson College for a while. She worked as a legislative assistant to Senator Cohen, and then as the director of the Small Business Association uh, in all of New England, Small Business Administration, uh, and then she entered elective politics, and she just a year ago was elected to her fourth term in the United States Senate, where she has distinguished herself, and I hope she's going to, David said she's going to talk about moderation, and compromise in politics, something that in our country is sorely needed now uh, and is much absent. But Susan has come to represent uh, the pragmatic, 
and I think realistic politics of compromise in our state and in our country. Uh, and I personally look forward very much to hearing from her, as I know you do as well. She's been a wonderful representative of our state. She's been a dear friend to me for many years. Dan mentioned my scholarship program. We provide a scholarship to a graduate from every high school in Maine. I hope some of them are here this evening, uh, some of the scholarship recipients. Uh, Susan was wonderful and came down and spoke at our function, helped us raise money uh, for that program to help needy Maine students. And she's here tonight uh, to talk to us about politics in our country. So please join me in giving a warm Kobe welcome to Senator Susan Collins. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. What an honor it is to be introduced by the great George Mitchell. I really can't thank you enough. President Green, it's wonderful to be back at Colby. And George, I am impressed by the number of your family members that uh, you convinced to come here tonight. They have all contributed so much, and I've been fortunate to know many of them for several years as well. Although I've never gone one-on-one -on -one with Swisher, but I hope to at some point. I'm a good foul shooter, does that count? <laughs> from Waterville to Washington, from Northern Ireland to the Middle East, Senator Mitchell has created a legacy of accomplishment and service. Our nation and our world are grateful for his dedication. But even as he has built a truly remarkable international and national reputation, what I like best about George Mitchell is that he's never forgotten where he came from. His love of Maine shines so brightly. So we thank you, Senator Mitchell, for all that you've done. I'm honored to be here once again at Colby College. Last year, at President Green's inauguration, Colby awarded me an honorary degree. That meant so much to me because it was exactly 100 years ago that my great aunt, Clara Collins Piper, received her Colby degree. What a remarkable woman she was. She took the train from Caribou at age 17 to Colby. This was 1909. She attended Colby until she ran out of money. Then she taught school until she could earn enough money to come back, complete her degree, and graduate in 1914. How unusual it must have been in those days, particularly for a young woman, to want an education that much. The journey from Capitol Hill to Mayflower Hill is one that I always enjoy, particularly when my destination is the Gold Farb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement. Before I begin my formal remarks, let me say that I am very aware that last month's lecture was on the longstanding tradition of satire and mockery in American politics, particularly directed at those of us in public office. 
I'm just hoping that those of you who attended that event view it as a fascinating history lesson and not as an instruction manual, at least not for tonight. As Senator Mitchell indicated, my topic this evening is why moderation and bipartisanship lead to progress. The flip side of that premise is, of course, how hyperpartisanship and incivility in Washington and throughout our nation elevate extremism and prevent progress. If you feel like you are living in one of the most partisan times in modern American history, there's a reason for that. You are. I make this statement based on an analysis of party unity voting in Congress published by the well-known Washington news magazine CQ Weekly, a publication that covers Congress in a decidedly nonpartisan manner. Because we have the good fortune this evening to have the lecture's namesake with us, let us look at the percentage of party unity votes that occurred in the Senate when George Mitchell was the majority leader. Now, by party unity votes, I'm referring to the percentage of Senate votes where the majority of the Republicans vote one way and the majority of Democrats vote the opposite way. During Senator Mitchell's six-year tenure as leader, with one exception, the percentage of party unity votes hovered around 50% to each year. In fact, in Senator Mitchell's first year as leader, the percentage of party unity votes was only 35%. In contrast, last year, it was 67%. That actually was an improvement over two years ago when it was 70%. Another way to look at this is by considering the votes of individual senators to see how often each votes with his or her own party, whether or not the votes are controversial. Last year, all but three of my Republican colleagues voted with their caucus on more than 80% of all votes cast. By the way, Lisa Murkowski, Kelly Ayotte, and I were the three senators. The discerning individuals in this hall will notice what the less partisan senators have in common. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side of the aisle, only one Democrat voted with his party fewer than 93% of the time. In fact, eight Democrats voted with their party 99.5% of the time, and 11 Democrats did so on 100% of all the votes cast last year. Now, I support the two-party system, and I'm certainly not trying to imply that over the past half century, everyone always got along all of the time. But like most Americans, I've never believed that either party has a monopoly on good ideas. The strength of the Senate is that it is the world's greatest deliberative body, where proposals are intended to be considered from all possible points of view, debated, even argued about, and then eventually advanced or rejected through negotiation and compromise. 
But as you can see, the world's greatest deliberative body didn't do much deliberating last year. I have my own theories about what causes the hyperpartisanship that we see in politics today. And the great thing about being a senator is I can set forth my ideas tonight without the years of painstaking research and mountains of documentary evidence that the scholars in the audience need to produce to support their ideas. While there are myriad causes, I want to highlight four interconnected factors that contribute to the problem. First is the general lowering of the level of discourse that we have seen in the internet age as media such as Twitter and anonymous online comments have emerged as the preferred arena for political debate. Studies by the Pew Research Center have found that the internet is rapidly displacing face-to-face -face contact and that websites devoted to political and social issues increasingly are tending toward the extremes where alternative views are either ignored or misrepresented and ridiculed. In short, people tend to congregate online with people who think as they do. When they encounter opposing viewpoints, the trend is to attack, not to debate. We have all seen routinely how seemingly mundane discussions deteriorate into online food fights. And while I personally will never understand why anyone would care what Chickadee 48 or Forrest Grump would think about an issue, those anonymous posts, those pseudonyms, can certainly get a reaction. A fairly innocuous op-ed that I submitted to a Maine newspaper last month illustrates the now familiar pattern. I was explaining my view that federal agencies have an obligation to use the most current scientific information in their decisions and that members of Congress have an obligation to provide oversight to ensure that is done. This isn't exactly the type of article that would capture the imagination of the American people or inflame passions, one would think. Well, my piece generated 48 reader comments. All but four were anonymous. The very first comment accused Republicans of being greedy. The second called Democrats stupid. That was basically the high point of the discussion. <laughs> It went downhill from there. Very few of the comments had anything at all to do with the subject of the article that I was writing. A second factor that is a close cousin to the bruising internet chatter is the ca cable and radio shows whose ratings depend on reaching a small but highly partisan portion of the electorate. Certain television shows will invite only those who will inflame the debate, those who will suggest compromise or try to tone down the rhetoric won't be invited at all. The tone of these discussions has leaked into the halls of Congress even during formal ceremonies. Consider, for example, the House member from my own party who interrupted President Obama's speech to a joint session of Congress a few years ago and yelled out, you lie. 
or the House Democratic member whose contributions to the health care debate consisted of asserting that Republicans had a two-word plan, die quickly. Now, neither of these comments did anything to elevate or add to the debate on health care. A third related factor is that we live in a time of never-ending campaign cycles. When I first was elected to the Senate, some in Washington would cynically refer to odd-numbered years in Congress as work years, and even-numbered years as campaign years. If only we could keep to that schedule now, it would be a marked improvement. And speaking of campaigns, if we could have the slide. Does anyone have any idea what this is? I know it looks like a Rorschach test. But in fact, it's the outline of a congressional district in Pennsylvania. There it is. Let me show you another one. You see this line along the side? That's because the district has to be contiguous. What they've done is in, what a surprise, it's near Chicago. Sorry, David. <laughs> You could probably tell me about these neighborhoods and why they go around Oak Park, but I have a feeling there's a reason. Now here's another one. This looks like my idea of what the Aleutian Islands look like. <laughs> but it's a congressional district in Florida in this case. So as you might suspect, gerrymandering of congressional districts is the fourth factor. Gerrymandering is an old concept, but it is being elevated to an art form to create one-party congressional districts. With only two districts, Maine is relatively immune. But in many states, the boundaries of districts can be truly Byzantine, where the sense of community built by history and geography is giving way to the desire to create so-called red or blue districts perpetually safe from electoral challenge. In a primary election, candidates from the extremes of the political spectrum tend to have an advantage. The check on this has been that in the general election, the victorious candidate is often the one who can win the votes of the center. So in a balanced district, you have an imperfect but relatively effective equilibrium where the system incentivizes primary voters to select candidates with broader appeal so that they can win in the general election. And this also incentivizes candidates to take more reasonable positions. In unbalanced gerrymandered districts, however, this equation gets turned on its head. The primary winner is the, in an overwhelmingly red or blue district is the odds-on favorite in the general election. In these districts, the voices, the votes of independents and moderates from both parties are marginalized. And as a result, congressional districts are producing members of Congress from the extremes more and more often. When you combine these four factors, it becomes harder and harder to get people to work together. I'm uncertain who it was who first described politics as the art of compromise, a maxim to which I have always subscribed. 
But that maxim seems woefully out of fashion today. Sitting down with those on the opposite side of an issue, figuring out what issues matter the most to each side, negotiating in good faith, and attempting to reach a solution are actions often vilified by hardliners on both the left and the right. Far too often, reaching across party lines, even when it produces results, is greeted with scorn by strident partisans who accuse the compromiser of being a sellout. For far too many today, Achieving solutions is not the primary goal. Rather, it is scoring political points, even if that means that the problems confronting our country go unresolved. And that is surely one reason that Congress is held in such low esteem today by the American people. In fact, I remember one poll about a year or so ago that ranked the favorability of Congress compared to colonoscopies and root canals. <laughs> and guess what? We were, we were ranked lower than both colonoscopies and root canals. As the title of my talk indicates, I firmly believe that bipartisanship and compromise lead not only to action, but also to better results. And I believe that the converse is also true. Partisanship and intransigence leads to worse results. When we act unilaterally, we tend to either make bad decisions or spiral into dysfunction, or both. A recent example involves the Senate rule changes sur surrounding the filibuster. In the Senate, procedural tactics were increasingly used to prevent the minority from offering amendments during the last Congress. This caused the minority to overuse the filibuster filibuster to stop bills to which it could not offer any changes. That in turn led the majority party to break the Senate rules in order to change the Senate rules, no small irony there, in order to prevent the use of the filibuster in certain circumstances. The minority, appropriately enough, cried foul. An election occurred, the minority became the majority, and guess what? Now the new majority has changed its mind and decided that it likes those new rules after all, now that it favors their side. It doesn't have to be like this. Many of the great accomplishments that we have had in Congress have been the product of bipartisan efforts. I'm thinking of Senator Mitchell's efforts on the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, which are good examples, but I'm gonna talk about other ones tonight. An historic example that is fresh in my mind is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Last month, I had the good fortune to attend the 50th anniversary celebration in Selma, Alabama at the passage of this historic law. Our delegation was led by Senator Tim Scott, a Republican who is the first African American senator elected from the South since 1881 and by the great civil rights icon, John Lewis, who is now a Democratic congressman from Georgia. We commemorated the march from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the scene of the infamous Bloody Sunday attack on March 7, 1965. 
Just as an aside, I have to tell you how moving Congressman Lewis's remarks were at the ceremony. He demonstrates an amazing capacity for forgiveness. There was not a trace of bitterness in his retelling of the repeated jailings and beatings that he endured as he fought for justice and equality as the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. At the ceremony, Congressman Lewis sat next to Peggy Wallace Kennedy, the daughter of Governor George Wallace, who ordered the state troopers to assault the peaceful marchers, including John Lewis, whose skull was fractured that day. How powerful, how wonderful it was to see George Wallace's daughter standing side by side with John Lewis. The powerful themes of redemption and forgiveness resonated throughout that weekend. It was an experience that I will never forget. The Voting Rights Act was dependent on a bipartisan effort in Congress. Senator Mike Mansfield, the Democratic leader, and Senator Everett Dirksen, the Republican leader, wrote the bill together in close consultation with President Johnson. Senators Mansfield and Dirksen worked together to overcome the many obstacles they faced in getting it through Congress, fighting back delays in committees, rounding up votes to overcome amendments and filibusters that could kill the bill, and strategizing how to get the bill through conference. The bill passed the Senate by a vote of 79 to 18, with just one Republican voting against it, along with 17 Democrats. When I was in Selma, Lucy Baines Johnson told me a story of her father, President Johnson, signing this historic law. As a teenager, watching her father at the bill signing ceremony, she saw him turn and give the first signing pen to Everett Dirksen. Daddy, she later asked him, why did you give that pen to that grumpy old Republican? Because, Lucy Baines, LBJ replied, without the Republicans, that would have been just a bill, not a law. There is a reason why President Johnson's biographer, Robert Carroll, described him as the master of the Senate. Let me further illustrate the power of bipartisanship with the story of the repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell law. In 2010, I joined Senator Joe Lieberman in leading the fight to repeal this law that prevented patriotic gay and lesbian Americans from serving in the armed forces unless they concealed their sexual orientation. My view was that we ought to be expressing our gratitude to anyone who's willing to put on the uniform of our country, not drumming them out of the armed forces. Now keep in mind that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was signed into law by a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, in 1993 and enjoyed widespread bipartisan support for many years. Its successful repeal was going to require Republican as well as Democratic votes. As difficult as it may seem to believe now, five years later, in 2010, outright repeal was still controversial. For example, while the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
testified in favor of repeal, the Commandant of the Marine Corps was strongly against repealing this 17-year-old discriminatory law. In March of 2010, during consideration of the huge defense policy bill by the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Joe Lieberman, an independent, Chairman Carl Levin, a Democrat, and I, a Republican, joined forces and pressed the case for repeal. Two Democrats on the committee, one with extensive military experience, argued against repeal, as did former POW and Republican presidential candidate John McCain. After a very lengthy and extremely contentious debate, the committee voted 16 to 13 to include repeal in the defense bill, not exactly an overwhelming vote. Nevertheless, this was a significant first step, even though at the time I was the only Republican on the committee to vote in favor of repeal. But I was optimistic that ultimately I would be able to convince others to join me. In December, during the final days of the legislative session, the giant defense bill, which included the repeal provisions, was brought up on the Senate floor. But dysfunction in the Senate and disagreement over amendments stalled the defense bill and almost killed repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We appeared to be stymied. Senator Lieberman and I talked about how to deal with this big setback we decided to introduce separate legislation to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But the clock was ticking, and we were worried about how we would get our bill brought to the Senate floor. That weekend, Assistant Democratic Leader from the House, Steny Hoyer, called me. He proposed that the House, which was then under Democratic control, would pass a separate repeal bill, but he wanted a guarantee from Joe and me that we could round up a sufficient number of Republican votes to pass it in the Senate. Otherwise, he did not want to put his members through the vote again, and he didn't want to take up precious time at the end of the session. I told Steny that I thought we could. For the next 10 days, Senator Lieberman and I worked night and day to round up Republican votes, even as the clock on the 111th Congress ticked down. Many people thought that ours was an impossible task, but we made the case persistently, one-on-one, -on -one, with our colleagues. When the Senate clerk began to call the roll on our bill, I will admit that I was anxious, but I was also confident that the Republican votes needed to put the bill over the top were there, and they were. The final roll call on December 20th, 2010, was a filibuster proof 65 to 31, and history was made two days later when the president signed our bill into law. My point is that as with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, without bipartisan leaders and without the votes of members of both parties, don't ask, don't tell, never would have been repealed that year. And because there was bipartisan support, there's not been any serious effort to repeal the repeal, delay it, or turn back the clock. The government shutdown a year and a half ago provides another clear example of the damage caused by ideological polarization and its resolution once again 
demonstrates the power of bipartisan compromise. The shutdown started on October 1st, 2013, because Congress and the administration failed to reach an agreement to fund the federal government for the new fiscal year, which began on that day. Hardworking people in Maine paid a high price for Washington's hyperpartisanship. Small businesses such as inns, gift shops, B&Bs, and restaurants all around Acadia National Park lost some $16 million, about a million dollars a day, due to the closure of the park during the peak fall foliage season. That hurt not just the business owners, but the wait staff, the housekeepers, the store clerks. On Saturday, October 5th, as the shutdown ended its first week, I was alone in my Senate office listening to the highly partisan debate on the Senate floor. All of my staff had been furloughed. The debate on the Senate floor consisted of a Democratic senator followed by a Republican senator alternating back and forth, each blaming the other side with no one offering a solution. Finally, I couldn't take it any longer and thought this must stop. I turned on my computer, drafted a three-point plan, rushed over to the Senate floor, and implored my colleagues to end the impasse. I said that it was time for both sides to come out of their partisan corners to stop fighting and start legislating in a manner that was worthy of the people of this great nation. No sooner did I leave the Senate floor than my cell phone started ringing. First to call was Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who said, you're absolutely right, count me in, I want to help. The next call was from Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire with much the same message. Amy Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota, also called. Once again, perhaps the women in the room and the, uh, the discerning people here see the same pattern that I alluded to earlier. But I must, in all honesty, say that we also attracted a few good men as well. Very quickly, I was leading a bipartisan group of seven Republicans, six Democrats, and one Independent, my colleague from Maine, Angus King. We worked every single day, countless meetings and phone calls to come up with a compromise to reopen government. Reaching across party lines, we broke through the partisan impasse. Instead of finger pointing and blame fixing, we offered a solution. It showed that the two parties could come together, negotiate, and reach an agreement in an atmosphere of mutual respect and good faith where we shared a common goal. I call our bipartisan group the Common Sense Coalition, and we continue to meet and seek solutions across the partisan divide. Compromise is difficult, but governing without it in a democracy is impossible. Rather than second best, a compromise reached through honest debate and negotiation and consideration of alternative viewpoints very often is not just the best chance to prevail, to get something done, but also the best answer. Often what makes a policy issue challenging is that there are valid arguments and concerns on both sides. In such cases, the optimal resolution accommodates the concerns of the opposing sides to the greatest extent possible. For many of the issues that we consider in Washington are not about fundamentals, 
They're not about right versus wrong. The vast majority of policy disputes, whether on tax policy, spending priorities, environmental decisions, or a host of other subjects, require a careful and informed balancing of different points of view. In short, they require compromise. There is no magic bullet. Washington is unlikely to change unless those outside of Washington demand it. We who represent the people of this great nation must put progress over partisanship, statesmanship over stridency, and compromise over conflict. I hope that the examples that I've provided this evening will underscore this critical point. Unyielding adherence to an extreme viewpoint is easy. It is compromise, the hard work of bringing people together to find common ground that requires determination, intellect, and courage. It may not be easy to be passionate about compromise, but it is easy to be passionate about the justice, opportunity, and progress that compromise can produce. Thank you. Thank you. We have some time for a few questions. Thank you. We have a microphone, if you don't mind, that we'll try to use because we are live streaming this event. Um. Thank you. Um, I, my question to you is, do you favor a second national park for the state of Maine? The issue of having a second national park for Maine in the Katahdin region is a very difficult one. I look for guidance to the people of the region. My friends who represent western states tell me lots of stories about the difficulty of federal ownership of land. Acadia has been a wonderful success. The question is whether the economic development and the jobs that the Katahdin region so desperately needs would materialize if there were a second national park in the Katahdin region. I have not made up my mind on whether or not that is a good thing. And to me, the fundamental question is whether or not federal ownership of that land would increase job opportunities and help restore a measure of prosperity to that region, which desperately needs it, um, given the closure of the mills. So I'm looking to the people of that region there is, um, right now, there is not a consensus for a park, um, but I'm continuing the dialogue. Could I make one quick comment, if you don't mind? We have a tradition at the Mitchell Lecture where we try to broadly link our questions to the presentation. And, and I'm sure the senator would take any questions, but I do know there are some students here that are doing some work, actually, on the senator's presentation. Um, again, I'm sure the senator would take any question, but, uh, but maybe if we could link those to the presentation, if that's okay. Sure. Whatever you Broadly defined. Uh, on, on, uh, on behalf of the citizens of Waterville, we thank you for joining us here tonight at this special event in honor of our most favorite citizen and statesman, Senator Mitchell. 
Uh, my question is, uh, what is your position on the Citizens United case, which in effect really opens the floodgates to money in politics and encourages the bipartisan gridlock that we're experiencing today? I did not agree with the Supreme Court's decision in the Citizens United case. I, I was a very early co-sponsor of the McCain-Feingold bill, and Citizens United struck down major provisions of that law. So I wish the Supreme Court had not ruled as it did, and uh, I disagreed with the, uh, the ruling. It is not easy to craft a response to Citizens United. I think that all of us should be able to agree, however, on greater transparency, on, uh, on contributions, on more rapid reporting of contributions, and that these organizations that have these innocuous names, Americans for Apple Pie, uh, that we should be able to find out more easily who is funding those groups on both sides. And I think, uh, so I think a first step is more disclosure and more rapid reporting. The other point I would make is the rules have to be the same for both sides. And that's, that's been a problem in the past also. Yes. So recently, uh, 47 Republican senators sent a letter to Iran regarding um, Obama's policy with the uh, nuclear situation over there. You were not one of them, obviously. You went against party lines and um, voted against that. I was curious, was that based on agreement with Obama's policies, or is that based on an opposition to the uh, increased uh, partisanship within international relations of the United States? Uh, great question, and the answer is neither. Uh, I decided not to sign that letter because I thought it was completely inappropriate. I did not think as a senator that I should be writing to the Ayatollahs in Iran during a time when the president was engaged in very sensitive negotiations. As a senator, I believe that my role is to give advice to the president, to the secretary of state, perhaps even to our negotiators, but writing to the Ayatollah and giving him a lecture on our American Constitution just seemed like a very serious policy mistake to me. Speaking about cooperation and working across aisles. Why do you identify as Republican and not as an independent, for example? I am a Republican because I believe in core Republican values. I believe in personal responsibility, in individual liberty, in smaller government. I believe in communities. I believe that government functions uh, best when it's closer to people, I believe in a strong national defense. I don't mean to imply that Democrats are opposed to all those things as I say that, uh, but I view those as core Republican values. I see myself as being in the tradition of the Republican Party that has always been in the Northeast. And it, it, that goes to the Margaret Chase Smith, to Bill Cohen, Olympia Snow, um, it, the more centrist part of the Republican Party. And that's why I'm a Republican. Plus, it's in my DNA. We had, and Senator Mitchell was talking about my family goes back in government and politics for 
many generations in Maine. In fact, uh, four generations on my father's side served in the state legislature. One was a Democrat, but we try not to let that be known. Uh, thank you very much for your service to our country. Really appreciate it and for your time tonight. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, an issue that's going to affect all of us here in the room, uh, especially young people, and that's climate change. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has proposed the Clean Power Plan uh, to cut emissions of carbon from our nation's power plants by 30 uh, percent, which is really the single biggest action that uh, our country can take on climate change. Um, I was wondering uh, your position on the Clean Power Plan, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for the question. First, let me talk generally about climate change, and then I will get to your specific question. First of all, I believe that climate change is real and that human activity contributes to it. So I just want to start off by establishing that fact. I have visited both the Arctic and Antarctica. And both trips were to learn more about the effects of climate change and to meet with scientists who are doing the research in both areas. I'll never forget going to Barrow, Alaska on the Arctic Ocean, not the most beautiful part of Alaska. And I could see that the permafrost had melted to the point where the telephone poles were starting to tilt over. I talked to native people who told me that they were seeing insects that they had never seen before for generations. We flew over part of northern Canada where parts of the forests had been decimated by an insect that used to be killed by cold weather, probably no problem this winter, but cold weather and instead is now reproducing twice during a season and had killed acres and acres of forest. In Antarctica, I met with uh, professors from the University of Maine and that other college in Brunswick who were, who were working there and who had been drilling into the into the ground and getting ice cores and we saw glaciers that were melting in New Zealand. I also saw uh, how the ice had retreated enormously. In the Gulf of Maine, look how warm the water has gotten and it's brought different species into the Gulf of Maine that threaten some of our native species. Uh, the acidification of the water also is a big problem for some shellfish, although apparently not lobster. Um, but it's hurting our oysters, our clams. So I think the evidence of climate change is all around us and is compelling. I have consistently voted against attempts to prevent the EPA from issuing clean air regulations in this area, um, such as the, the one that applies to emissions that come in from other states because we're at the end of the nation's tailpipe. And even though we don't have coal-fired power plants in Maine, we get the emissions from other states. And at one point, uh, talk about a it was a vote that I believe strongly in, so it wasn't a hard vote, it was just an awkward vote. I was the only Republican to vote to uphold some EPA air regulations um, against an amendment that was offered by the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, and it was a 50-50 vote. And I cast the vote that on, a t on a tie, an amendment, fails. Um, you can imagine how popular I was uh, with my leader for a while there. Um, the new clean power regulations, which set new emission standards for, uh, for power plants, are still in the comment phase. 
And I think there's been something, there have been hundreds of thousands of comments. I have always found that it is wise policy to wait until the final regulations come out before committing to what I'm going to do because I don't know what the final regulations are going to be. I'm sure there will be an attempt to block them no matter what, uh, but I want to wait and evaluate them. But if you look at my record, I have a very strong uh, record on climate issues. Let me just mention um, a couple of things I think we could do very quickly in this area. One has to do with cook stoves. In developing countries around the world, very dirty cook stoves are used that are hazardous to the health of the families that use them and contribute something like 18% of the soot that's in the atmosphere, which is, one of, which is a greenhouse gas. For a relatively modest amount, we could work with international organizations, and I've talked to Melinda Gates from the Gates Foundation and uh, about whether they would get involved, and replace those cook stoves with clean burning cook stoves or solar cook stoves. And it would not only be a big boon to the health of the families that use them in those villages, but it would help with greenhouse gas pollutions. That's low-hanging fruit that we ought to be plucking in this area. And uh, that's just one of the, the bills that I'm on. I'm also on an energy efficiency bill that would set standards for um, appliances. There, there's lots we could do to save energy, reduce emissions, and uh, the big one, though, as you point out, are the power plants. Chris. Senator Collins, uh, how would you say that being from Maine and having roots in Maine politics influenced your drive for bipartisanship in Washington, D.C.? Well, Maine has a long record of sending people to Washington who are pragmatic in their approach and who really are there to serve and solve problems. I was very much inspired by Margaret Chase Smith, whom I met when I was 18 years of age, a senior at Caribou High School. I was one of two students who was sent to Washington as part of the uh, Senate Youth Program, which exists to this day. I had never been on an airplane. I had never been to Washington, and I'd certainly never met a United States senator. And Margaret Chase Smith spent nearly two hours talking with me, which I, if given what our schedules are like, you know, when I have two minutes, it's, it's a lot of time. And she never once talked about what it was like to be the only woman in the Senate. Instead, she talked about her famous declaration of conscience in which she took on her fellow Republican, Joseph McCarthy, who was smearing people and calling them communists. And I remember leaving her office being so proud that she was my senator and thinking that women could do anything. And this was back in 1971, and we didn't necessarily know that even though I came from a family that was extremely supportive and encouraging. And when I look back, I think that that was my first step on the journey to the United States Senate. I didn't know it at the time that 25 years later I would run uh, for the Senate. And today on the Senate floor, I sit at the seat at the desk that Margaret J. Smith had, which means a great deal to me. Bill Cohen was a huge influence on me. I worked for Bill for 12 years in Washington. I saw him make courageous decisions. I remember when I was an intern and he was a freshman congressman, his voting to impeach President Nixon in, my job was to open up the hate mail, and believe me, there was a lot of it. And I saw him do what he thought was right. 
George Mitchell, a wonderful role model as well. Someone, we were talking earlier, the, when I think back at the Iran-Contra hearings, and his talking to Ollie Nor North and telling him that God doesn't take sides in, in politics and that people who disagreed with Colonel North were just as patriotic as he was and how incredibly moving that was. Olympia Snow, we have a great history. Ed Muskie, think what he did with clean air, clean water, working across the aisle. That's been the main tradition. And if that could be the tradition of every state, what a better world this would be. And we would get so much more done in Washington. Thank you. Unfortunately, we, we do have to wrap it up. Senator, you are certainly following in that tradition, and we are so proud of you. The Goldfarb Center always gives a small gift. One more round of applause for the Senator. <laughs> that was spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.